Here is the news. So far, we know there are 23 survivors after Manchester United's air crash at Munich this afternoon. When the accident happened and I, uh, and I survived it okay, you could say that, that, that you couldn't get any, any luckier than that, really. In February 1958, Bobby Charlton survived one of English football's worst disasters. 23 of the Manchester United party died in the Munich air crash. But Charlton was one of the lucky ones to come away with his life. He went on to a remarkable career with England and Manchester United. You know, I've just been so fortunate, really, in my, in my life. So, lucky, definitely, without any question. Now in his 70s, Bobby Charlton can look back on a life that has overcome tragedy and embraced enormous success. He was top scorer for England with 49 goals and for Manchester United with 249. He was a, a naturally gifted player. He was two-footed as well. I think one of the most two-footed players we've ever seen. He could go either side, shoot with either foot. He had a grace, but a change of pace like a, a strike of lightning. You know, both change of pace and from his boots. I mean, he, the power in his shooting was immense. There are race horses and there are thoroughbreds and there are derby winners. And Bobby was right up there. He was a beautiful player, he was a lovely striker of the ball. I mean, 30 yarders into the roof of the net. I mean, I couldn't even reach the goal from 18 yards. Such a great way with football that you've got to say, can it be? Well, yes, it can. It all started in Ashington, a small mining town in the northeast of England in October 1937. Bobby was the younger brother of Jackie Charlton, who would go on to play professional football with Leeds and England. It was a family that had football in their blood. My mother was a, a Milburn, um, and uh, the Milburns were four brothers that actually went to play uh, as professional footballers. My second cousin, which is my mother's cousin, Jackie Milburn, played for Newcastle, so, you know, we were a football family. Then my brother Jack and my, myself, went into the professional game and took it from there. But it, it, was, it was really, there was nothing else in life that didn't appear to me except football. Playing for England schoolboys, Bobby scored two goals and was spotted by Joe Armstrong, who took him to Manchester United. Here he was taken under the wing of Jimmy Murphy and Matt Busby. Together, they were building one of the football phenomena of the 20th century, the Busby Babes. By now, the, the Busby Babes were getting a really good reputation, and, uh, and if you were a Busby Babe, you were very lucky. When Matt Busby started playing young players, there was a great sympathy, you know, and a great feeling for Manchester United, you know, that it, this, this was something daring, you know. Playing 16 and 17 year old players in the first division was unheard of. I felt we had reached the stage when I could nearly have sat in my office for about 10 years and just went out and saw the mice. They had reached that stage of experience, power, skill and everything else. At the same time as completing his military service, the young Bobby Charlton was working his way through the Manchester United youth teams. Then one day, he got a tap on the shoulder from Matt Busby. So Matt came in and he said he wanted to see me in his room and I went upstairs and I... There's only two things it could be for. You're in trouble for some reason or other, or he was gonna, he was gonna pick you. And he says, well, I'm gonna play you tomorrow in the first team. And you just dream of things like that. That's, uh, it's everything I ever, I ever wanted to be, a footballer. Bobby made 14 appearances in his first season and qualified for a championship medal. And he settled into life with the stars at Old Trafford, scoring goals and losing to his teammates at poker. He was the worst poker player ever I've seen in my life. <laughs> now, I mean this sincerely, because we played cards. Bobby was known as Happy Harry, and, and truly, Bobby, the young Bobby Charlton would, would join the poker school. And the first thing he would do, I repeat, he would put his money in the table, and he would say, I can, excuse me laughing, I can see it now. 
when I lose this, I'm not writing any checks this week. <laughs> That's before the game started. He was a terrible poker player, he was. But the innocent days of the Busby babes were short-lived. Matt Busby had taken United into a pioneering tournament, the European Cup. So in February 1958, the team had overcome Red Star Belgrade and were through to the semi-finals. En route to Manchester, the plane stopped in Munich to refuel. And there at Munich Airport, the event that was to change Bobby Charlton and Manchester United forever. We were all together that day. We were a team. Kenny Morgans, myself, Big Mark, Liam Whelan, genius Dennis Violet. We had to get onto the aeroplane and then, and then there was some technical reason why we, had, we couldn't go and then we had to come back into the terminal again. And, uh, and this happened twice, I think. But uh, it was decided, you know, that they would, they would take off and uh, we were all, all quite pleased about, about it. At last we were, we were on our way and we were going to be in Manchester in a few hours. And, uh, and of course it never happened. The plane just went and it, it went and it went and it went down the runway and, and then uh, you, you started realising, you know, this is, this is happening, this is not right, there's something wrong with this. And then we hit the perimeter fence and, and uh, that's all I can remember really. These are the people so far known to have survived. Of the Manchester United party, Matt Busby, manager, and the following players. Greg, Wood, That's something you Fultz, can't plan. You, you don't plan. It happened. and uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to help one or two others, some that weren't able to help themselves. Morgans, Berry, Charlton, Violet, and Scanlon. Bobby Charlton and Dennis Violet, when I got to them, were both unconscious. I pulled them 20 or 30 yards away from where they were and left them over a pile of rubble to get them away from where it was burning. And one of the biggest shocks I got was when I looked up after attending to someone else, Bobby Charlton was standing, staring at what was the remainder of the plane in a fuel dump. And the shock I had, I dragged him away earlier as a dead man. And the shock was actually seeing him standing there in a daze. What Harry Gregg did in, in the accident, you know, was, was marvellous. You know, I, I, can't, I can't believe what he did. It was just terrific, you know, the bravery that he had. Going back, I don't know if I could have ever done that, really. Back in Manchester, the city was in shock. The next few days were a fight for survival for so many who'd been on the plane. Matt Busby and Bobby Charlton were among the lucky ones who pulled through. I'd like to say a few words to my mother. I hope she's OK yes. and taking it well. Look at her while you're doing it. She, she, hasn't, she hasn't been down to see me, you know, but it's a bit a long way and I'm all right. I know. If I'd have been a bit worse off, like some of the others. Archie Ledbrook, old Tom Curry, the trainer, Walter Crickman, the secretary, they all died. It was just an unbelievable tragedy. Um, from from the, the, height, the heights of euphoria, you, you know, we were qualified for the semi-final of, the, of the, the European Cup. It was just sensational. And then for it all to just be, it just collapsed, really. And um, the, club, you know, the club was never really the same again. You know. As Charlton spent time with his family, Manchester United struggled on with players who had survived and players they borrowed. Bobby came to see them beat Sheffield Wednesday in the FA Cup and decided he was fit to rejoin his team. Incredibly, a depleted Manchester United got to the FA Cup final that year, but Bolton Wanderers were in no mood for sympathy, beating them 2-0 at Wembley. Busby was looking to the future, and Bobby Charlton was very much a part of his plans. New additions included the Scotsman Dennis Law, who scored for United in the 1963 FA Cup final, a 3-1 win against Leicester City. 
It was a significant day, five years on from the disaster. When you think that uh, the crash was in 58, five years later, there Samat was at Wembley to go and win the FA Cup was obviously something very special for him. It was obviously special for everybody else in the, in the game to go there and win. It was the start of a golden era for Manchester United. Busby added another star to the talented team he already had, joining Charlton and Law, a youngster from Belfast called George Best. The three of them went on to form one of the most devastating combinations English football has ever seen. We were three different players and uh, for some reason we gelled for a little spell. If he was in the centre of the field and coming through and he was 30 yards from goal, I knew that he was going to have a shot. And I knew that if he got it on target and the goalkeeper saved it, there were the chances of him holding it cleanly was very rare. And therefore, as soon as I saw him line up for a shot, I would be in on the goalkeeper. So I, I got a lot of my goals from Bobby, really. I used to think sometimes, that, you know, if I was a Man United supporter, it must, it must be great going down to Old Trafford just, just at this particular time. The fans had to go down because they were afraid that they might just miss that one game where George Best was absolutely sensational. Or where Dennis Lowe and uh, Sparks seemed to fly wherever he was going and it was so exciting. And I scored a few goals as well from different distances, you know, and, uh, and between us all, you know, it, it must have been really exciting if you were a fan to actually, to actually go and watch it. And, and whenever anybody mentions, mentions Best and the Best Lowe child, I get a little... You get a little buzz, you know, I think, you know, that was great. But spare a thought for those who had to play against Bobby Charlton. It was a tough task. He could really hurt you. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's collection of the ball, his body swerve, I can see it now, his body swerve, which would send you into row Z, and then he'd be back again on direction and just power and you know, whip the ball over that, that strike from 30 yards, even 35 yards we've seen him score for. Meanwhile, Charlton was just as effective for England as he was Manchester United. He'd scored on his debut and never really stopped scoring for his country. His first World Cup action was in Chile, where England reached the quarter-finals. With home advantage due in 1966, the prospects looked good. Alf Ramsey took charge and, and he said we will win the World Cup in 1966 because he, he, he could see the, the players that were starting to come through into the team, you know, Jimmy Greaves, Bobby Moore, and Gordon Banks was the best goalkeeper in the world then. And he, he realised, you know, that uh, it would be a good team that was going to beat us. Under Alf Ramsey, England had time to build and with a hugely talented set of players to work with, expectations were high. And there was home advantage. England would play all their games at Wembley, and the nation was behind them. After a tentative start, a goal by Charlton really got England's challenge going. Well, I think one of the most uh, notable moments, I guess, which, which helped relax the team was the, the fantastic goal he scored against Mexico. Bobby came out with this goal, he beat a couple of people, and hit it with his right foot, you know, and an absolute scream in, in the top corner of the net. It was Jeff Hurst who got the crucial goal in a bruising encounter with Argentina. It wasn't particularly pretty, but England were in the semi-finals of the World Cup. Leading up to the semi-final, we'd worked our way in, into that position. We hadn't played particularly great. What made that semi-final special was it was such a cracking game. You know? We played against Portugal, who, who are a team that let you play. Letting England play was surely a mistake. They gave Bobby Charlton the space to destroy them. I 
Arsenal scored two goals and we were in the final. It didn't matter who we were playing in the final. You know, we'd gone so far there was no way that we were going to lose. Alfred worked it out and, uh, and he made us aware, you know, that we, we were better than them. We were better than them and we had to just go out and prove it. Bobby was one of the most influential players, if not the influential player of our team. And the Germans uh, in, in their manager, Helmut Schorn, saw this. And what he said to uh, Franz Beckenbauer was that he's the best player in the, in the English side. You've got to make sure, Franz, that uh, you keep an eye on him and mark him throughout the game. What, what he didn't know that um, Sir Ralph Ramsey has said to Bobby Charlton, Franz Beckenbauer is the best player on the German side. He's the only player that I think could do something unusual and turn, turn the game. You've got to mark him for 90 minutes. So what we saw was some of the best players we've ever seen marking each other and virtually cancelling each other out. It was the Germans, though, who drew first blood with a goal from Helmut Haller. Even when they scored the first goal, I don't think there was any great panic. We, we thought, no, we, we'll still go on, and sure enough. believe it when they equalised in, in the last minute of the game. I couldn't believe it. But then I'll said, OK, you've beaten them once, you have to go out and beat them again. The goal that Jeff Hurst scored, which was the third goal, which, is, which goes down maybe as the most controversial goal that's ever been scored in the history of the World Cup. It'll always be shown because it's still under, it's very indecisive. It doesn't actually show you whether it went across the line. But I, when I was there, I thought, well, that's crossed the line. And I was really upset because the linesman had his flag up, and I thought, well, the linesman's just going to disallow it. And I went, no, he can't disallow it. That was a goal. And he wasn't. He was saying, no, the ball had crossed the line. When the final whistle went, I said to our Jack, I said, well, our, our, and he said, what, what about that kid, you know, what about that? I said, well, our lives will never be the same again. It's just such a monumental thing that we've done, that it will never be the same again. Really. And that's been the fact. So the Charlton brothers went back home to Ashington as 1966 world champions, and the following season, Bobby also helped Manchester United to another league title. That meant that United and Matt Busby had another shot at the trophy they wanted more than any other, the European Cup. There was a difficult semi-final against Real Madrid and by half-time in the Santiago Bernabeu Stadium, things weren't looking good. We were winning 1-0 when we arrived and we uh, unfortunately played badly uh, the first half. Second half, we just found something and we scored two goals. We scored two goals and instead of just being equal to them, we, we were in the lead and we... And it was the most emotional match maybe I've ever played in. And there was more emotion in store for Manchester United in a European Cup final against Benfica at Wembley. Well, there was a lot of emotion because of, of Munich, obviously, that we actually got to the final. And we had a really tough game. It was physically tough, it was humid. Many felt it was Bobby Charlton who made the difference, with a little help from his teammates. The first one, it, 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 he had the easiest job in the world, of course, because I crossed the ball for him and it was, he didn't have really anything else to do but to knock it in the back of the net. On 79 minutes, Grasa equalised for the Portuguese and once again it was extra time for Charlton at Wembley. We went into extra time and, and, and they collapsed. Benfica collapsed in extra time. Goals from George Best and Brian Kidd and then a fourth from Bobby Charlton meant that at last Manchester United had won the European Cup. 
to go there and then lift the European Cup 10 years after Munich was just something just special. And of course there was a great emotion for, for Mad Busby because of the accident. It was his players that had died and here, here was a new set of lads and Manchester United was going to be alright and it was a really, really lovely night that. Uh, the International Team Trophy for the Team Performance of the Year presented to you tonight by your brother Jackie. It was a unique achievement for Bobby Charlton. He became the first player to win a European Cup final as well as a World Cup final. You can't really compare them, they're different. I mean, if you win the World Cup, it's because you're playing against the best player. And you can literally, at the end of it, say, oh, well, we were the best. And, uh, and the European Cup, uh, you, you play with the lads that you work with all the time. England is like a little bonus, you know, because you don't have to play with them all the time. You, but occasionally you get together and you're playing with the top quality players. Uh, the club maybe not, but uh, the club is, you, you, you know more about the players that you have at your club. And it was, uh, it was just marvellous. In 1970, Charlton travelled to Mexico with the England squad. But the defence of the World Cup title ended as he was substituted against Germany. It was revenge for 1966 as Germany overhauled a 2-0 lead to win 3-2. It was a disappointed squad that arrived back at London Heathrow. It was just circumstances, you know, the ball just seemed to fall right for them at the time that mattered and it, uh, it didn't fall right for us. Uh, we didn't make any real mistakes as far as I was concerned. They didn't improve the play when they got behind. It just happened, you know, these things happen. Bobby Charlton played on for his club until 1973, by which time he'd played 758 times, scoring 249 goals. He was one of the greatest players we've ever produced. And I think scoring 49 goals in 106 games for England at the top level of world football is fantastic. I think people don't seem to recognise the, in many respects, the fact that he scored one goal in two games at, at top level. After football, it did take some time before Bobby found the best role for him. He was player-manager at Preston North End for a while, and then he was involved in a number of initiatives which revolved around coaching football. Eventually, though, Charlton joined the board of directors at Old Trafford, and once again the combination of Bobby Charlton and Manchester United brought familiar success. You can't go anywhere in the world without talking about Manchester and Bobby Charlton. They just go hand in hand. They, just, they were just made for one another, and he, he certainly upholds everything that's good about Manchester United now in, in his position as director. Hard to believe that terrible poker player has become one of the, the top diplomats in football. <laughs> Happy Harry Bobby Charlton, the worst poker player ever I've seen in my life. Happy Harry, though, became Sir Bobby Charlton, a British sporting icon and ambassador. I still love the game and I want to watch it and uh, the big events, the big games, the good players. I'm like everybody else, I'm more of a football fan now. In the end, everything has come full circle for Sir Bobby. The Munich survivor has become a symbol of United's history, and he's still an inspiration. Alex Ferguson is very welcoming of, of anything to do with the history of Manchester United. He asked Nobby Styles and myself if we would go and talk to the first team and have a little word with them about the history of the club, you know. Who knows, you know, the, the difference between winning the Champions League might, might have been that, that little chat, you know, that Nobby and I had with him because I think the press at the end of the Champions League when we won it, a lot of them said the difference between the two teams really was the history of each club. They could say what they want about Barcelona, Real Madrid, nothing, nothing will ever compare with the history of Manchester United. <laughs>